Hi friends, my name is Davey. No matter when you're watching this or where you are, I'm excited to be with you. Now you may not know me and, and I may not know you, but this is what we have in common. We've all experienced loss. We're all a part of this exclusive club that none of us wanted to pay the membership dues for. Five years ago, I lost my wife and unborn child to murder in a home invasion. And as, as we get to know each other tonight, and as I tell you more of my story, my prayer is that you leave feeling a sense of hope in the midst of your storm. Let me, let me introduce you to my late wife, Amanda. This is us in April of 2015, just a few months before the tragedy. And I was introduced to her by one of my good friends from college. I was away at college in South Carolina uh, on scholarship uh, playing baseball, and I was on the athlete hall, and I met this guy, which I was a little confused as to why he was on the athlete hall, because he was a, a golfer. <laughs> but nevertheless, he and I used to joke around that we should meet two girls who were best friends so that we could date them and hang out all the time. And after our freshman year, he came back our sophomore year and he goes, man, I don't know why I didn't think about this, but I need to introduce you to my girlfriend's sister. He had started dating a girl he dated in high school. And I'm like, I don't know. I was skeptical of the whole setup thing. He goes, just come with me to Elkhart, Indiana over fall break and meet her. If you don't like her, we can just hang out the rest of the week. It'll be fine. So I did. And we went up and went to a Hawk Nelson concert where we met for the very first time. And then after the concert, we went where I believe every great relationship should start, and that is Steak and Shake. I don't know what you know about Steak and Shake, but I love the Frisco melt, right? Now, now we were sitting there at Steak and Shake, and, and, and I'm drinking my chocolate milkshake, and she's drinking a strawberry milkshake, and I was trying to kind of loosen things up a little bit and be cute, and I crack a joke, and she laughs, and she shoots milkshake out of her nose. And I'll never forget looking across that table and going, that's gonna be my wife, I'm, I'm gonna marry her. And, and, and I fell fast and hard for her. We dated over long distance for about two years. And after we both graduated college, we ended up getting married in a double wedding with her sister and my best friend. And uh, it just was the start of this beautiful dream life for us. In fact, we went and started at what I would consider to be a dream job. We started working at a church in South Carolina where we were seeing lots of people come to know Jesus as their personal savior. I was starting a, a student ministry where we're seeing a lot of teenagers show up and, and, and their lives getting turned around. And man, we thought we'd be there for the rest of our lives. But, but at some point, we, we started feeling this unrest, this stirring. It, was almost, it almost felt like a prompting or a calling. And, and maybe you've experienced this before. It kind of keeps you up at night. It wakes you up in the morning, and it, it makes you kind of salivate at the mouth. And yet it's so intimidating to think about and daunting to think about actually stepping into. This is what we were experiencing. And after some time of prayer and some time of consulting with some of our mentors in life, we felt like that God was calling us to move to Indianapolis to start a church. And so we packed up a moving van, and on November 11th, 2011, we moved to Indianapolis to plant this church. Now, we knew that we wanted to we wanted to buy a house when we got to Indianapolis because we didn't want to send a message that this was just some kind of a temporary endeavor. This is something that we just, you know, if this doesn't work out, if it fizzles out, then we're going to move back. We really felt like we were called and planted to help start a life-giving church in the middle of a major metropolitan city and see people's lives filled with hope no matter what they were going through. And so we got a realtor and we started looking around at a bunch of houses. And one day we look at about 25 houses, but the very first house that we looked at was a house on 2812 Sunnyfield Court. And Amanda goes around the house and she starts looking around all the different rooms and she comes back to me and she goes, Davey, this is our house. Very first house we looked at. This is our house, this is our house. I said, man, hold on, hold on. I, I've watched Chip and Joanna. I, I know you don't buy the first house that you look at. So let's, let's look. We don't know where the safe neighborhoods are, the good schools are, where we want to start this church. So let's look around. And we looked around about 25 other houses. And then we made our way back to 2812 Sunnyfield Court. And Amanda then gave me the look that every husband has, has gotten before. And that's the, you should have listened to me the first time, babe. It would have saved us a lot of time. Look. And we ended up deciding to put an offer on 2812 Sunnyfield Court. Now, we were church planters and had no idea where our revenue was going to come from. And so we, we felt convicted that there was a certain number that we needed to stick to to put, this, put an offer in on this house. 
And so we went to the realtor, we said, put, put this offer in, and the realtor on the other end of the table laughed us off the table. Said, if, if, if you want to even entertain negotiation, you're gonna have to come back with a much bigger, bigger offer. And so we went back to Amanda's grandmother's house and we began to pray about it. And we said, um, God, this doesn't have to be our house. Uh, you know where you want us to be, where you want us to plant this church. And if you don't want us in this house, close the door. But if you want us in this house, uh, bust it wide open. Uh, make this house ours. Amanda's grandmother told us that night, faith is living without scheming. So the next day we went and put the same offer on the house and they accepted. And 2812 Sunnyfield Court became our house. I mean, it was an incredible house. I mean, we started our life and started making memories in that house. We started our church in that house right there in that living room. We had the very first gathering. We had four people sitting in the living room and I preached a message called invite because we had four people and we needed to invite more people. And the very next week, we had four people show up, the same four people. So I scrapped the message I had planned and I preached an, another message called invite harder. And, and man, slowly but surely, this, this little church started to grow and we became eight people in the living room and 12 people in the living room. And, and, and I'll never forget starting our kids' ministry back in the master bedroom and putting veggie tails up on the screen. And we'd crawl into to bed at night and we'd have goldfish crumb crackers in our sheets. And it was just a sweet, sweet season. Uh, I'll never forget when a pregnant woman came in the first time to our church gathering and we were like, oh, come on in, you, you count as two people, let's go. We were just trying to figure out a way to manufacture this thing and get it up and going. We, we Skyped at one point with Amanda's sister in Elkhart and we, and we called ourselves a multi-site church. We're one church in many locations and we're just having the time of our lives trying to figure this thing out. All right there at this little house of 2812 Sunnyfield Court. It's a special house. It's the house that we brought Weston, our firstborn, home to when we brought him home from the hospital and had the whole weird, awkward realization that, uh, oh, the nurses aren't here and what do we do now? And, and we started to forge our way and build this life. But it was also the same house that on November 10th, 2015, I walked into my greatest nightmare. I came home from the gym, I had gone early to the gym and was coming back to shower and I walked across the threshold of the front door and I found Amanda on our living room floor, face down in a, in a pool of blood. And she was breathing, but she was unconscious. And I called 911 as fast as I possibly could. And it felt like it, it, felt like it took three hours for them, to get there, to, for them to get there. And, it, and I realized that later it was only three minutes. They, they came and attended to her and, and while I was, sitting there waiting for them, my mind began taking snapshots of all of these things that seemed out of place, you know. In moments of trauma like that, everything seems to go in fast motion and slow motion all at the same time. And, and I remember thinking like, man, if we just get her to the hospital and, and everything, everything's gonna be fine. Like, like I couldn't imagine what had gone wrong, what had taken place, but there was things disheveled all over our, our living room. And, and lamps that had fallen over and a ladder that had fallen over and her credit cards were strewn out all over the place. And it just didn't make sense in my mind. She was pregnant with our, our second. She was 13 weeks along. So maybe something had gone horrifically wrong with the pregnancy. She'd gotten out of the shower and she'd gotten lightheaded and, and she'd fallen over and, and everything kind of went in disarray at, the, at that point, I, I, I don't know. But the next thing I remember is we're following the paramedics to the hospital and they take us to a waiting room and I'm sitting in a waiting room and I'm shaking back and forth saying, Weston, we're gonna be okay. I'm holding him, we're gonna be okay, bud. We're gonna be okay. And I expect them to come back and say, hey, everything's fine. It was a big scare, but Amanda's good. She's stabilized. Let's go back and, and see her. And, and that's not what happened. Doctors and investigators came in and, and they began asking me questions. And when they surmised that I, I, I didn't know what had gone on, they, they said, Davey, she's got three bullet wounds in her. One is, one is in her arm, one is grazed over her back, and one is in the back of her head. And if the swelling in the brain goes down, we're gonna to try to operate, but the prognosis is really, really grim. It seems like that, that your home was broken into and she was, she was shot. And I don't know what came over me in that moment. I'm not sure if it was shock or if it was faith or if it was some weird combination thereof, but I grabbed the doctor's hands and I began to pray the biggest, boldest prayer of faith that I could muster up. I said, God, 
this cannot be happening. We're following after you, and, 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 and I thought that you would protect my family, but if there are people in this hospital that need to come to know you, I pray that you would use this as, as a miracle, would you restore Amanda right now? Would you heal her and show people that are maybe trusting in science or trusting in reason or trusting in something other than you? Would you, would you show them that, that you are a miracle worker? And I had all the faith there was in the world in that moment that God was gonna come through. And 24 hours later, she was pronounced officially deceased. November 11th, 2015. Exactly four years to the day after we packed the moving van up and moved. Now, I understand how difficult it is to go into the holiday season after experiencing loss. Thanksgiving was our very first holiday. I mean, literally weeks after losing Amanda. And we celebrated Christmas with my side of the family at Thanksgiving, and I'll never forget opening up a leather jacket that Amanda had purchased for me. And I'll never forget watching Weston open up presents that she had purchased for him before she was killed. And the feeling of that just felt absolutely hopeless. I mean, the, the pain was debilitating sitting there. It was supposed to be the most joyous time for us, and, and here we were just experiencing sorrow. And over the next several weeks and the next several months, I began to wrestle with some major questions. And maybe, maybe these are questions that you're wrestling with as well. The first question I really wrestled with was the question, why? Like, like, why is this happening? Why me? Why is there th this much pain and suffering in the world? Why is there crime? Why is there these massive questions? And, and growing up, I, my dad was a pastor, and, and, and I had been taught that faith was the place that I needed to turn to with these questions. Uh, and, and, and when there was times of major loss, I needed to turn to my faith. But the depth of this loss presented questions to my faith that I had never asked before. You see, the problem was growing up, it, it seemed like it wasn't okay to ask questions of God or to have some kind of doubts. Now, while this, this, this wasn't necessarily what was overtly taught to me, it's what I observed. And, and what I observed was that if you ask questions or if you had doubts, you, you were kind of looked down upon in Christian circles or you were, you were judged. And, and maybe this is your experience with church or religion as well. Don't ask questions. Don't, don't have doubts. That in fact, you don't have faith if you do have questions. Can, can I just stop and say this? Great grief is not an indication of little faith. Great grief is an indication of great loss. And the more that I dug into the Bible, the text for our faith, I, I, I was surprised because the more that I dug in, the more I saw that it was full of people who had been heroized, men and women of faith who had these major questions for God, and they wrestled with them and they grappled with them. And then the more I researched, it wasn't just in the Bible where these questions existed. I saw that in, in every major religion or ideology, everyone's trying to figure out an answer to this. Why is there pain and suffering? Why is there loss? Why is there grief? Why me? In fact, I, I began to, to peel away that, that every major religion or ideology says that if you've found yourself in some kind of situation of pain, loss, or grief, there are certain steps or there are certain things you need to do in order to get out of it. This is what you need to do in order to kind of get to God or, or attain something or kind of find joy or peace or nirvana again. But then I found that the God of the Bible I found that Jesus taught something very different. And he didn't just teach it, he demonstrated it. He, he taught that while every other major ideology says this is what you need to do to get to God, he said, in the midst of your pain and brokenness and suffering, this is what I'm willing to do to come to you. That I'm with you in it. And this, friends, is what Christmas is all about. I mean, I think sometimes we, we romanticize the Christmas story and the scene with the stable and the manger and the animals, and it looks really pretty and put together, but it was messy. The context of the first Christmas was set in a time period in history that was riddled with pain and poverty and oppression and injustice. 
I mean, the Roman government that was occupying the land at the time kept the people under the thumb of poverty and, and oppression. Families were losing their children to slave labor if they couldn't pay the exorbitant taxes. Sickness and disease was rampant throughout much of the land. I mean, it was a time in history marked by pain and suffering. And people were looking for answers. And they were asking questions. And then in that context of history, one promise broke through, a, a light in the darkness. And it says this in Matthew 1, 23. It says, Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. Jesus came to earth so that God could be with us. Maybe that's all you need to hear tonight, friend, is that he's with you. And, and he didn't just send a, a card or, or some kind of gift or platitude to merely console us, but he came to be with us so that he could eventually restore us. Jesus entered into our pain, into our plight. He subjected himself to the human experience, not just to show us that he sees our pain, but to demonstrate he's with us in our pain. In my, in my why question, I was looking for a reason. But, but if I was honest with myself, I knew that a reason wasn't going to take the pain away. I needed something much stronger than a reason. I, I needed a relationship that was going to somehow fill this, this massive void that I felt. I needed presence. And I needed presence through my pain. See, what I began to discover is that his presence, Jesus' presence, is with me in my pain, and, and listen, is stronger than my pain. Now, this doesn't take away or diminish our pain at all. I, I, I know that what you're experiencing hurts deeply. And I'm sure that you've experienced, frankly, some ridiculous platitudes that people have said trying to comfort you. I mean, I experienced them. She's in a better place, or everything happens for a reason, or well, at least you're still, still young. And, and while maybe those were good intentioned, what meant most to me were, were the people who, who merely said, hey, I, I'm with you. I'm here. I, I don't need to say a thing. In fact, there aren't any words that I can say. I just want you to know that I love you. But what I experienced is, is that even, even that began to fade and people began to, to move on. But, but God's presence, not, as, not necessarily his words, his presence, that's what began to comfort me more than anything. And here's why. Because his presence never moves on. It never leaves you. You're not alone. Now, I realize you may, be, you may be skeptical of God. Maybe in the past you've thought of faith as this like crutch for weak people. But isn't it, isn't it true that there's something about loss that just kind of takes the legs out from under us? I mean, I know it was true of me. I found myself in a place where my own strength and my own intelligence and my own acumen was not going to get me there. So, so if, that's, if that's true of you right now, what are you using to walk if you, if you can't on your own? In my experience with loss, I didn't need my faith as a crutch. I needed it as a lifeline. And I believe that's God's invitation to you tonight. He's saying, hey, can I come sit at your table? And, 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 and can, can I have a conversation with, with you? Like, can I come and be with you? Not, not to replace what was in that empty seat that's at your table, but, but to remain with you. I believe he's saying, no, no, I don't want to answer the questions because I know that ultimately just answering the questions won't remove your pain. I want to give you a place to take your questions and most importantly, take your pain. I want you to bring me your questions, your anger, your frustration, your sadness, your disappointment. Like God can handle that. Not only is God saying all throughout Scripture as I read it, not only is he saying it's okay to wrestle with him, and to ask these questions, I believe he encourages it, that he invites it. In fact, 
I believe that asking him these questions and wrestling with these things is in fact the path toward healing. So ask him the why questions. The second question that I begin to wrestle with, and maybe you're wrestling with as well, is will I ever blank again? You fill in the blank. You know, for me it was, will I ever feel joy again? Will I ever have a meaningful life again? Will I ever have a, a meaningful marriage again? Because what we're experiencing here is not just the death of our loved one. What, what we're experiencing is the death of the dreams that accompanied our loved one. Essentially, the question we're asking here is, can anything good come out of this? What's really interesting is that Jesus was from a place called Nazareth. In fact, there were some really painful, dangerous situations that led him from his birthplace, Bethlehem, to Nazareth. And there was an old adage back in Bible times where they would literally ask the question, can anything good come from Nazareth? I find it so ironic and very, I think, providential that Jesus specifically chose Nazareth, that, of the place that nothing good could come out of, to start the healing around the world, to, to bring the message of the good news of the gospel to the world from a place that nothing good can come out of. And that's the message of Christmas. I'll never forget while I was sitting in the hospital with uh, Amanda, and we were waiting for the test results, I knew that if she was conscious, if she was in any way kind of understanding or aware of what was going on, even though we couldn't, we couldn't tell, that she would want to listen to worship music, specifically from a band called Elevation Worship. And so I put a phone on the, the edge of her bed and I put it on Pandora radio station and I set it to the Elevation Worship radio station. Now, if you're familiar with Pandora, you know that it randomizes what gets played. You never really know what's gonna come up first. And as I put that phone there, I'm sitting across the hospital bed with her sister in the same positions that we were sitting at several years before when we were watching her give birth to my son, Weston. We're sitting there in that same spot and, and I put Pandora radio station on. The very first song that popped up right there on that Pandora station was the song by Elevation Worship, Nothing Is Wasted. I, di I didn't really know what that meant at the time. All I knew is it felt like God stepped into that moment and he was telling us, hey, I'm, I'm here, I'm with you. I'm not gonna waste this pain. I, I, I'm gonna restore it. And then a few days later, I, I realized the metaphor of this was, was even, even richer in our lives. It, it, it threaded a, a little bit deeper because what Amanda did prior to the season where, where she was killed, she, she used to restore furniture. That she had made kind of a hobby of it. She'd go to these festivals around town and she would take these broken and beaten up, battered pieces of furniture and she would restore them and bring some life back into them. I'll never forget phone call after phone call where I'd be coming home from work and she'd say, David, there's this dresser on the side of the road that someone threw out. Can you, can you go and pick it up for me? And I'd, I'd pick it up and I'd look at it. I'm like, what in the world is she gonna do with this? I mean, this is trash, this is garbage. Someone threw this out, they discarded it. And I'd take it home for her and say, hey, babe, what are you gonna do with this? And the first time I asked her that, she looked at me with a little bit of hurt in her eyes and she said, she said, hey, babe, trust me, give me a little time and, and I'll restore this. And I, I felt like after, after Amanda was killed, I felt like that, that that was the message God was trying to bring to us where he was saying, David, I know this looks like, like, like garbage. I know that, that the world would say, what in the world, what good could come out of this? But if you trust me and you give me a little time, I'll restore this. Now, I didn't know exactly what that looked like, but the promise of it, the fact that God showed up there with me, it gave me some kind of hope. He, he, he somehow promised that in time that, that there is gonna be some kind of healing and restoration that happens in this. Now, you've heard the phrase, time heals all things. But, but I'll tell you, friend, time by itself does not heal all things. But time plus Jesus 
begins to lead you down the path of healing because Jesus cares about your pain. I believe the message to you and to me is, listen, I am heartbroken over this as well. In fact, we see that Jesus, as he walked this earth, he experienced loss of some close loved ones. The most poignant, shortest verse in the Bible is Jesus wept. When he experienced the loss of a loved one, he wept. And I believe he wept because he's saying, this is not what I meant for my creation. I did not want them to experience grief and loss like this, but I'm gonna make it right. Not immediately, but eventually. There's a, there's a bigger story going on here. You see, the, the very first Christmas when Jesus was born, it was just a part of this bigger story that God was writing. He, he Jesus, was God in the flesh, he lived a perfect life, and then he was crucified on a cross. He went through the most unbearable, unthinkable, unimaginable pain that any of us could fathom. And he did it for you. And he did it for me. But listen, friends, three days later, he took that situation and he reversed it. When he was raised from the dead, literally got up from the grave. And, and he did that so that we could experience new life. You see, for Jesus, death became a pathway to new life. And, and I believe this is what he wants to do for you as well. Even though you've experienced this death, you've experienced this loss, he wants to bring new life out of it. You see, through him, Death does not have to have the final word in our story. So I believe when you ask the question, will I ever blank again? I believe Jesus becomes the answer to that question for us. And you can take that question to Jesus. The third question that I had was, what do I do now? What, what, what do I do now? I mean, my life has been completely upended with this loss. What do I do now? I, I firmly believe and I've experienced that the only way out of this pain that you're feeling is to walk with Jesus directly through it. You see, our tendency in just human nature and in this holiday season, you may be tempted to do this, is to, to numb, to numb the pain, to escape it, to kind of run away from these overwhelming feelings of grief because they are, they're overwhelming. Sometimes it feels like we can't even just, we can't even get up, we can't even get out, get out of bed. We, we can't get up and, and carry on in our day. And here's what I wanna encourage you, because I remember specifically in Christmas season, the first Christmas, lying on the couch, being so sick because grief was so pent up inside of me, I was physically ill. And I received a text message from a friend of mine who's a pastor who lost his daughter. And the text message reminded me of something that he wrote in a book that he wrote about when he lost his daughter. And it's a concept that I wanna share with you tonight. It's a concept called run toward the roar. This is what he shared with me. He said, you know, Davey, when, when lions go on a hunt, they hunt in gender roles. So you have the female lion, the lioness, that's actually the hunter of the pride. The male lion is more bark than its bite. And we've all seen kind of the National Geographic scene where you go down to the watering hole and you have the antelope or the zebra or something, and the lions are there to try to seek after or hunt after the prey. Well, the male lion, he has a specific role. He will get up on his haunches, he will flare his mane, and he will let out a loud roar to scare the prey into an ambush that the female lions have set up. And what, what the prey needs to do is, is counterintuitive because if they run away from the roar, then they run into the, this thing that's going to devour them. But if they run toward the roar, then that actually is their pathway to safety and to freedom. Now, what he shared with me is he said, Davey, grief is a roaring lion. It is threatening to devour us. He said, but what I wanna encourage you to do is run toward the roar. Run toward your grief. Anytime you experience some of those painful emotions that your, your natural tendency would be to shove aside, to escape, to numb, to do anything you can to not experience them, 
I, I want you to actually lean into them. Uh, because if you box them up and, and if you kind of put them away, they're gonna end up booby trapping us later. That the pathway to experiencing the restoration, this, this is called restoring Christmas to experiencing this, is to run toward the grief. So there were a couple things for me that began to help me uh, unravel some of that in my own spirit. I told you I was physically sick and I'll never forget driving in the car. And for some reason, the way that my phone pairs with my Bluetooth, it plays the very first song that's kind of on the alphabetical order list of, of my iTunes. And the very first song during that season happened to be a song that was played at our wedding. And so I'd get in my car and I'd start playing that song on our wedding. And up until this point, I would slam the dashboard. I was so frustrated and angry and sad and distraught. And I didn't want to hear it. I didn't want to, I didn't, I didn't want to have anything to do with it. And then I remembered the words of my friend. He said, run, run toward the roar. And so this particular time, I, I was sitting in my car. It came on and I ended up turning up the radio instead of turning it down. And I listened to it. I leaned into the song. And I listened to it on repeat. And man, I'm telling you, the worst ugly cry that you've ever seen in your entire life. I'm glad that it was on the side of the road and that there was nobody else in the car with me and they couldn't see what was going on because I just let all of that emotion out. But what was so amazing is that I felt like God met me in that. Because immediately after the waves of grief, there was this strange sense of these waves of grace that came over me. And that knot that had been filling up my stomach and making me physically ill was gone. Now, that's not to say that it didn't come back, but it was to say that I now knew and had the tools to, to, to figure out how to, to walk in this, this path, to run toward the roar. It, it inspired me. So the next thing I did is I said, you know what, I'm gonna go back into the house for three months, I had not gone back into the house. It had become a crime scene, and it was something that frightened me. It's something that, honestly, it had a stronghold on me. I didn't want to go back in and relive and experience the traumatic moments of, 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 of witnessing that, of, of being by my wife's side right there while she was breathing her last. I didn't, but I knew that I needed to run toward the roar. And so I show up one morning, my dad drove me to the house and put my headphones in and I walked across that same threshold of the front door and I walked around the house and I listened to worship music, the same kind of worship music that Amanda would have wanted to listen to. And I remember lying down on the spot that I found her and I cried and I wept and the same thing happened. Waves of grief were followed by waves of grace. And I experienced this that when I faced those emotions, they, they somehow, they lost their power over me. You see, Jesus isn't just with us during this holiday season. He wants to help us. He wants to heal us. So while you're tempted to gather around as a family and just not talk about it, not mention their name, not do, not do anything that would remind you of the loss of your loved one, of your friend, my encouragement would be, this holiday season, take some time. Talk about your loved one. Don't, don't sweep it under the rug. Tell stories. Cry. Weep together. Because I, I can promise you, those waves of grief will come, but the waves of grace will follow. And you might even find yourself laughing together and seeing and feeling this weird sense of joy in the midst of this pain. And you might even find yourself holding both of those two things together in this weird conglomerate that's called grief and hope. Maybe this holiday season you need to spend some time journaling and writing out some memories. Maybe you need to spend some time with a counselor and talking about some of these things. Maybe this holiday season all you need to do is focusing on is focus on waking up tomorrow. Just wake up <laughs> and then wake up the next day. In 2016, the year after my wife passed away, my one New Year's resolution was this, wake up and make my bed. That's it. 
every day I was going to make my bed because that at least got me started moving forward. Listen, friends, you and I are never going to move on, but we can move forward in life. We can start walking. My counselor told me this, and I think it's really important for us to understand that we can hold in tension these two things. We can weep really well. We can lament. We can enter into that. In fact, I think that is the portal to experiencing hope and healing. But, but he cautioned me, Davy, weep well, but don't wallow. Because grief can have a tendency to, to overtake us. And so tonight, maybe you're experiencing these questions. Maybe you're experiencing the why questions. Maybe you're experiencing the will I ever blank again question. Maybe you're experiencing the question of, okay, what do, what do I do now? Wherever you find yourself on that spectrum, here's what I believe. I believe that you may not get the immediate answers to those questions. Because for me, as I ask those questions, this is what I got. I got one word, and that was the word with. <laughs> and for now, I want you to lean into that word. I am with you. That's the message that Jesus has for us tonight. He's with us. His presence is with us in our pain, and His presence is stronger than our pain. This is why Psalm 23, verse 4 says, Even though I walk through the darkest of valley, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. There's a passage in the Old Testament where a guy asks God, Hey, what's your name? And God responds to him and says, I am. Now, if I were that guy, I'd been like, I I am, I am, I am what? I am who? I'm sorry, I didn't catch that, that last part. God said, I am. That's his name. He is. He always is, meaning he always is what we need. He was, he is, he forever will be. This is why the presence of God is so powerful. Because if you need comfort right now, he's a comforter. If you need healing right now, he's a healer. If you need provision, he's a provider. If you need shelter, he is your defense and your fortress. He's saying this. When you ask why, he's saying, I'll be with you. When you begin to ask, well, okay, will I ever again? He's saying, hey, I will. I will restore you. Okay, well, what do I do now? What do I, what do, I do? I'll show you the way. And tonight, friends, I believe that he is asking and he is knocking and he is inviting and he's saying, will you, will you let me come and sit at your table this holiday season? Will you let me be with you? I just want to pray over us. Right now in this moment, wherever you're seated, kitchen table, your living room, can I just pray for us? Jesus, I just ask that you would overwhelm us with a sense of your presence. Right now, where my friends, my brothers and sisters, where they're sitting, I pray that you would allow them to, to not just know in their head that you are with them, but allow them to experience it. Would you reach across the, the camera lens right now? Would you reach into their homes? Would you reach into their hearts? And would you allow them to feel and sense your presence beyond an emotion? Your presence supersedes our emotions. You are with us always and you will never leave us. I pray that that would be the reality that we experience. And as we lean into that, God, I pray that you would begin to heal and you would begin to restore. We love you and we ask that this season you would give us the strength to walk forward. And we'll follow after you. In your name we pray, amen.